How do a collection of cells remember anything? How do biological systems remember anything? How is that akin to the kind of memory we think of humans as having within our big cognitive engine? Yeah. One of the ways to start thinking about bioelectricity is to ask ourselves, where did neurons and all these cool tricks that the brain uses to uh, run these amazing uh, problem-solving abilities on and basically an electrical network, right? Where did that come from? They didn't just evolve, you know, appear out of nowhere. It must have evolved from something. And what it evolved from was a much more ancient ability of cells to form networks to solve other kinds of problems. For example, to navigate morphous space, to control the body shape. And so all of the components of, uh, of neurons, so, so ion channels, um, uh, neurotransmitter machinery, electrical synapses, all this stuff is way older than brains, way older than neurons, in fact, older than multicellularity. And so it was already there, even, even bacterial biofilms, there's some beautiful work uh, from UCSD on, 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 on brain-like dynamics and bacterial biofilms. So evolution figured out very early on that electrical networks are amazing at having memories, at integrating information across distance, at different kinds of optimization tasks, you know, image recognition and so on, long before there were brains. Can you actually just step back and we'll return sure. to it? What is bioelectricity? What is biochemistry? What is What are electrical networks? I think a lot of the biology community focuses on the chemicals as the signaling mechanisms that make the whole thing work. You have, I think, to, to a large degree uniquely, maybe you can correct me on that, have focused on the bioelectricity, which is using electricity for signaling. There's also probably mechanical. Sure, sure, by like knocking on the door. Yep. Yep. Uh, so what what what's the difference, and what's an electrical network? Yeah. So I want to make sure and and kind of give credit where credit is due. So so as far back as 1903 and probably um, late 1800s already, people were thinking about the importance of electrical um, phenomena in in life. So I'm for sure not the first person to stress the importance of electricity. Uh, people there were there were waves of research in the in the 30s, um, in the 40s, and then again, in the kind of uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s of, of sort of the pioneers of bioelectricity who did some amazing work on all this. I think I think what, what we've done that's new is to step away from this idea that, and, and I'll describe what, what the bioelectricity is, is step away from the idea that, well, here's another piece of physics that you need to keep track of to understand the physiology and development, and to really start looking at this as saying, no, this is a a privileged computational layer that gives you access to the actual cognition of the tissue of basal cognition. So, so merging that that developmental biophysics with ideas and cognition of computation and so on. I think I think that's what we've done. That's new, but people have been talking about bioelectricity for a really long time. And 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 so I'll so I'll define that. So, um, what happens is that uh, if you have uh, if you have a single cell, cell has a membrane. In that membrane are proteins called ion channels, and those proteins allow charged molecules, potassium, sodium, chloride, to go in and out under certain circumstances. And when there's an imbalance of, uh, of those ions, there becomes a voltage gradient across that membrane. And so all cells, all living cells, try to hold a particular kind of voltage uh, difference across the membrane, and they spend a lot of energy to do so. When you now, now so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a single cell. When you have multiple cells, the cells sitting next to each other, they can communicate their voltage state to each other via a number of different ways. But one of them is this thing called a gap junction, which is basically like a little submarine hatch that just kind of docks, right? And the ions from one side can flow to the other side and vice versa. So isn't it incredible that this evolved? Isn't, isn't that wild? Because that didn't exist. Correct. This had to be. This had to be evolved, and, and it had the, to be invented. That's right. So somebody invented electricity in the in the ocean. When did this get invented? Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so I mean, it's an, it, it is it is incredible. Um, the guy who discovered gap junctions, Werner Lowenstein. I visited him. He was he was really old. A uh, human being. He discovered them. Because you know what? Because who really discovered them? Lived probably four billion years ago. Good point. So you you give credit where credit is due. Good I'm point. just saying. He he, he rediscovered <laughs> he rediscovered uh, gap junctures. But um, when I visited him in in Woods Hole, uh, maybe 20 years ago now, uh, he told me that he was writing, and unfortunately, he 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 passed away. And I think this this book never got written. He was writing a book on on gap junctures and consciousness. And I think I think it would have been a, a an incredible book because because gap junctures are magic. I'll I'll explain why in a minute. 
uh, what happens is that just imagine the, the thing about both these ion channels and these gap junctions is that many of them are themselves voltage sensitive. So that's a voltage sensitive current conductance. That's a transistor. And as soon as you've invented one, immediately you now get access to, from, from this platonic space of, of mathematical truths, you get access to all of the cool things that transistors do. So now when you have a network of cells, not only do they do they talk to each other, but they can send messages to each other and the differences of voltage can propagate. Now, to neuroscientists, this is old hat because you see this in the brain, right? There's action potentials, the, you know, the electricity... Um, you can, you can, uh, they have, they have these awesome movies where you can take a zebra, like a transparent, um, uh, uh, animal, like a zebra fish. You can literally look down and you can see all the, all the firings as the fish is like making decisions about what to eat and things like this, right? It's amazing. Well, your whole body is doing that all the time, just much slower. So there are very few things that neurons do that other cells, that all the cells in your body don't do. They all, they all do very similar things just on a much slower time scale. And whereas your brain is thinking about thing, how to, uh, solve problems in three dimensional space. Um, the cells in an embryo are thinking about how to solve problems in anatomical space. They're trying to have memories like, hey, how many fingers are we supposed to have? Well, how many do we have now? What do we do to get from here to there? That's the kind of problems they're thinking about. And the reason that gap junctions are magic is, imagine, right, from the, from the, from the earliest, uh, from the earliest uh, time. I'm, here are two cells. This cell, uh, how, how can they communicate? Well, well, the simple version is this cell could send a chemical, a chemical signal. It floats over and it hits a receptor on this cell, right? Because it comes from outside, this cell can very easily tell that that came from outside. It, it's this whatever information is coming. That's not my information. That, that information is coming from the outside. So I can I can trust it. I can ignore it. I can do various things with it, whatever. But I know it comes from the outside. Now imagine instead that you have two cells with a gap junction between them. Something happens. Let's say the cell gets poked. There's a calcium spike. And the calcium spike or or whatever small molecule signal propagates through the gap junction to this cell. There's no ownership metadata on that signal. This cell does not know now that it's didn't that it came from outside because it looks exactly like its own memories would have looked mm -hmm. like of being of being of whatever had happened, right? So gap junctions to some extent wipe ownership information on data, which means that if I can't if if you and I are sharing memories and mm -hmm. we can't quite tell who the memories belong to, that's the beginning of a mind melt. That's the beginning of a scale up of cognition from here's me and here's you to no now there's just us. So they enforce a collective intelligence That's uh, right. gap junctures. That's that, right. It helps. It's the beginning. It's not the whole story by any means, but it's the start. Where's state stored of the system? So is there are some. Is it in part in the gap junctions themselves? Is it in the cells? There are many, many layers to this, as always in biology. So there are um, uh, chemical networks. So, for example, gene regulatory networks, right, which which are or, or basically any kind of chemical pathway where different chemicals activate and repress each other, they can store memories. So, in a dynamical system sense, they can store memories. They can they can get into stable states that are hard to pull them out of, right? So that's that becomes once they get in, that's a memory, a permanent memory of some or a semi permanent memory of something that's happened. There are cytoskeletal structures, right, that are physically they store they store memories in, in physical um, configuration. There are uh, electrical memories like flip flops where there is no physical, right? So, so if you look, I, I, I show my students this example as a flip flop. And the reason that it stores a zero or one is not because some, some uh, piece of the hardware moved. It's because there's a, there's a cycling of the current in one side of the thing. If I come over and I hold, um, you know, I hold the other side to a, to a high voltage for, for, you know, a brief period of time, it flips over and now it's here. But the hard, none of the hardware moved. The information is in a stable, dynamical sense. And if you were to x-ray the thing, you couldn't tell me if it was zero or one, because all you would see is where the hardware is. You wouldn't see the, the energetic state of the system. So there are also, so there are bioelectrical um, states that are held in that exact way, like, like, like volatile RAM, basically, like in the, in the electrical state of so the it's system. It's very akin to the different ways the memory is stored in a computer. So there's RAM. There's hard drives. You can make that mapping, right? So I think the interesting thing is that based on the biology, we can have a more sophisticated, you know, I, th I think we can revise some of our some of our um, computer engineering methods because there are some interesting things that biology does that we haven't done yet. But but you can but that map but that mapping is not bad. I mean, I think it works in many ways. Yeah, I wonder because I mean, the way we build computers at the root of computer science is the idea of proof of correctness, where we program things to be perfect, reliable. You know, this idea of resilience and robustness to un unknown conditions is not as important. 
So that's what biology is really good at. So I don't know what kind of systems, I don't know how we go from a computer to a biological system in the future. Yeah. I think that, you know, you know the thing about bi biology, like, is, is all about making really important decisions really quickly on very limited information. I mean, that's what biology is all about. You have to act. You have to act now. The stakes are very high, and you don't know most of what you need to know to be perfect. And so there's not even an attempt to be to be perfect or to get it right in any sense. There are just uh, things like active inference, minimize surprise, optimize uh, some some efficiency and, and and some things like this that 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 guides the whole the whole business i mentioned to uh offline that um somebody who's a a fan of your work is andre kapathy and he's uh amongst many things also uh writes occasionally a great blog and he came up with this idea i don't know if he coined the term but of software 2.0 uh where the programming is done in the space of configuring these uh, artificial neural networks. Is there some sense in which that would be the future of programming for us humans, where we're less uh, doing like Python-like programming and more, um, how, would you, how would that look like? But basically doing the hyperparameters of something akin to a biological system and watching it go and keeping adjusting it and creating some kind of feedback loop within the system so it corrects itself. Yeah. And then we watch it over time accomplish the goals we want it to accomplish. Is that kind of the, the dream of the the dogs that you describe in yeah. the nature paper? Yeah. 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 I mean, that that's what you just painted is a is a very good um description of our efforts at regenerative medicine as a kind of somatic psychiatry. So the idea is that you're not, you, you know, you're not trying to micromanage. I mean, think, think about the limitations of, of, of a lot of the medicines today. We try to interact down at the level of pathways, right? So, so we're trying to micromanage it. What the, what's the problem? Well, one problem is that for almost every medicine other than antibiotics, once you stop it, the problem comes right back. You haven't fixed anything. You were addressing symptoms. You weren't actually curing anything, again, except for antibiotics. Uh, that's one problem. The other problem is you have massive amount of side effects because you were trying to interact at the lowest level. It's right. It's like I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to program this computer by changing the uh, the melting point of copper. Like maybe you can do things that way, but my God, it's hard to to, to program at the right at the at the hardware level. So what what I think we're we're, we're starting to understand is that, and and by the way, this goes back to what you were saying before about. Uh, th that we could have access to our internal state, right? So people who practice that kind of stuff, right? So yoga and, and, and biofeedback and those, those are all the people that uniformly will say things like, well, the body has an intelligence and this and that, right? Like those two sets overlap perfectly because, because that's exactly right. Because once you, once you start thinking about it that way, you realize that the better locus of control is not always at the lowest level. This is why we don't all pro program with a soldering iron, right? We 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 take advantage of, of the high level intelligences that are there, which means trying to figure out, okay, which of your tissues can learn, what can they learn, uh, why, you know, why is it that um, certain drugs stop working after you take them for a while with its habituation, right? And so can we understand habituation, sensitization, associative learning? these kinds of things in chemical pathways. We're going to have a completely different way, I, th I think. Um, we're going to have a completely different way of, of using drugs and of medicine in general when we start focusing on um, the goal states and, and on the intelligence of our subsystems as opposed to treating everything as if the only path was micromanagement from chemistry upwards.